Shortly after escaping Ahsoka Tano, Commander Rex and the rest of the clones on the crashing Venator during Order 66, Maul's stolen Republic attack shuttle rustled the thick red Dathomirian foliage as it landed outside the darkened Night Sister stronghold. Not long ago, this was the site of his greatest defeat at the hands of his old master, when he was forced to flee after his mother sacrificed herself so that he may survive. He had dared not return after that. Now that Sidious was dead, it was safe, at least for now. Maul began tuning into the holonet and soon confirmed the death of Sidious he had sensed not long before. It was the work of a Jedi assassin, later revealed by Masameda to be Master Yoda, publicly during an emergency broadcast. Maul had doubted his senses, unwilling to believe that Darth Sidious could have died, but now he had confirmation. However, it did nothing to relax the former Sith Lord. If he had sensed correctly, then Skywalker must have become a servant of the dark side, just as Maul had foreseen. With no confirmation of his death, either on the holonet or through the Force, Maul had no choice but to assume the worst. Sidious's chosen right hand, the greatest threat to Maul's plans and the galaxy as a whole was still out there, and Maul had no recourse other than to kill him. Back on Polis Massa, we pick up right where we left off, at the end of part one. Anakin cradled his children next to his exposed, pale chest. First Leia, and then Luke. The warmth he'd felt in his heart almost cancelled out the near-freezing temperatures within the room. He couldn't believe they were alive. He almost didn't. But they were very much alive and well. After every bad thing that had happened, it was finally something good. But all good things must come to an end. Anakin was in no position to be their father. He knew that. Padme gently grabbed the children back and tucked them tightly in their warm blankets. Padme asked the medical droid if Anakin could speak. It explained that Anakin had only undergone the necessary surgeries to keep him alive, as well as the addition of prosthetic limbs. His new vocabulator had not been installed yet, as the droids were waiting for the delivery of a unit that could be programmed with his original voice. Padme nodded. She began to speak to Anakin. Anakin, you're their father. You deserve to see your children, and I wouldn't want to take that away from you. But you can't raise them. I'm sorry. Anakin shut his eyes. The warmth he had felt faded as if never there. Not yet, at least. Not until you've recovered. Physically. Emotionally. I don't want to take your children away from you, Anakin. But I cannot let them near you anymore. Because you hurt me. And so many people. Innocent lives. Younglings. Anakin wanted to say that he was sorry. He wanted to tell her that he would not make that mistake again. But he couldn't. And not just physically. Could he promise he wouldn't have another outburst like that? He wanted to tell her he did everything for her, but what he did was exactly the problem, not why. She didn't trust him, and he wasn't sure if he trusted himself. I let you see them now because you're not capable of doing anything to hurt them. But when you've recovered, I need to know you'll be better if you're going to be a part of their lives. I'm sorry, Anakin. Goodbye. Padme exited briskly, but sadly. This was as hard for her as it was for Anakin. Anakin wondered what he could do. Was there anything he could do to make it up to her? He didn't know. Maybe he didn't deserve to be a father. Before too long, Anakin had a second visitor, Obi-Wan. Bail had alerted Obi-Wan after Padme had left for Polis Massa, back on Naboo. Yoda had declined to come. Anakin's memories of Mustafar were hazy from pain and emotional distress, but he knew Obi-Wan had saved him on the lava bank. He wouldn't be alive if it weren't for him. Then again, he also wouldn't be a quadruple amputee and burn victim if it weren't for him. Given how awful he felt, 
Maybe Obi-Wan should have left him on that volcanic glass beach. Kenobi sat down where Padme had been, not a few moments before. He was hesitant before speaking. I'm sorry, Anakin. For all of it. I failed you as a master, and as a friend. I'm sorry it had to come to this. When I saw what you had done, Yoda and I agreed that killing the Sith was our only option. I begged Yoda to send me to kill the Emperor, but he said he was the only one powerful enough to kill him. He was right. I couldn't kill you, Anakin. I thought I would never forgive myself if I did. I'm not sure if you'll ever forgive me either. I don't deserve it. Anakin could tell the speech was rehearsed, but that didn't diminish the message. On Mustafar, he told Obi-Wan he hated him. Now he saw he couldn't blame Obi-Wan for what happened between them. Anakin remembered he was out of control. This was the only way he could have been stopped. He also remembered that Obi-Wan warned him not to jump. It was entirely his fault. His choices cursed him with painful consequences. I'm sure you're not pleased to see me. I'll be on my way now. Anakin was powerless to stop Obi-Wan as he stood up and left the room. Left him alone. Completely. Ahsoka had left for Mandalore. His wife had left with his two children. And now Obi-Wan. He didn't even have Sidious anymore. As frustrating as it was that he couldn't respond to his visitors, he needed more company than this medical droid. He needed someone. After a few hours listening to his respirator pulse hypnotically, Anakin drifted off to sleep. But it was not a restful one. Anakin was plagued not with visions of his wife dying in childbirth, but with memories of his crimes as Vader. He relived the horrors of when he sliced off Mace's hand, killing his fellow Jedi, killing younglings. Anakin awoke in a sweat, his heart pounding. It seemed he had only traded one nightmare for another. Mustafar may have resembled hell, but this was much more like it. Nothing he could do, nothing he could say, just the endless whirring of his respirator and cool air on his skin. Sleep, which was normally a reprieve from pain or stress, was the worst part. Anakin didn't like it, but the longer it went on, he couldn't help but think, didn't he deserve it? In Tales of the Jedi, we saw that after they buried the 332nd, Ahsoka and Rex went to Naboo to attend Padme's funeral, after which they split up due to Ahsoka's disillusionment. Rex then went on to visit Cut Quain, just prior to the second episode of The Bad Batch. Since Padme survived in this timeline, this chain of events didn't happen. Ahsoka and Rex stayed together as Rex began to unravel the mystery of the inhibitor chips. He and Ahsoka would visit Cut Quain on his farm together prior to the Bad Batch arriving on Seleucami. After visiting Cut, the two were camping far away from Imperial control by the Y-Wing they had stolen from the Star Destroyer Tribunal. It was at this camp that R7 received a coded message from Obi-Wan on the Fulcrum Frequency, sent during Part 1 of this story. R7 incessantly beeped to alert the others. Ahsoka and Rex's spirits raised at the possibility that Anakin had survived Order 66, but Rex warned that it could also be a trick by the Empire to trace their location if they responded. Ahsoka set the hollow communication device to one-way transmission, and she and Rex listened to the message with bated breath. Fulcrum, come in Fulcrum. Neither of them said anything, but they were mildly disappointed when Obi-Wan's voice came through, and not Anakin's. While Ahsoka had not taken the codename Fulcrum in this timeline yet, there was only one person Obi-Wan could have been addressing. I'll set this message to repeat in the hopes that you're still alive to receive it. The generals survived the attack, but they are in critical condition. They need you, Fulcrum. I'm sending rendezvous coordinates to you now. It would be better to explain in person. R7 copied down the coordinates to the Navi computer of the Y-Wing, while Ahsoka and Rex discussed the message. They agreed the message was genuine, and wondered what might have happened to Anakin that was so urgent and yet so sensitive. Rex remarked that he expected Anakin to survive the betrayal of the clones unscathed. Not too long after, Rex and Ahsoka left for the rendezvous point, Polis Massa, in the Y-Wing. 
where Obi-Wan waited for them. He and Yoda had been hiding there since they arrived, but Padme had agreed to find them somewhere safe to stay on Naboo. She set aside her issues with them for their importance to the cause of restoring the Republic. However, she had some difficulties since Naboo was incredibly pro-Empire, as it was the home world of the now deceased Emperor Palpatine. Ahsoka arrived and climbed out of the Y-Wing. Obi-Wan greeted her but became nervous upon seeing Rex. Ahsoka assured him that Rex was on their side and explained briefly about the inhibitor chips and how she was able to remove Rex's. She said that she would explain more once Obi-Wan explained what happened to Anakin. Obi-Wan nodded and led them into the facility. He wanted to explain what happened to Anakin, but he found it difficult to revisit his memories of Mustafar, of how he'd fail Anakin, and of what he'd done to stop him. He spoke nervously, which only heightened Ahsoka's anxieties about her master. Obi-Wan had not explained much by the time they reached Anakin's hospital room. He didn't want to keep Ahsoka and Rex waiting, and he decided it would be better if she saw what happened to Anakin rather than trying to describe it himself. Ahsoka feared what she would see, but there was nothing she could really do to prepare herself. She mustered her courage and went in. Obi-Wan lingered at the entrance as Ahsoka stepped slowly into the room, the cold air washing over her. Rex followed, not too far behind. The two of them went over to Anakin's bedside and looked down at him. First, Ahsoka was confused. It was hard for her to comprehend that this pale mass of flesh, covered in worrying robotic attachments, was indeed her master. When she finally recognized him, that feeling turned to shock. She covered her mouth and was almost immediately brought to tears. Ahsoka wondered if this was why she had felt Anakin's presence in the Force disappear before the clones attacked her. Was she feeling Anakin's suffering at the hands of whatever or whoever did this? Her emotional disturbance stirred the sleeping Anakin. It took a moment for her to notice that he had opened his eyes. He was mouthing something. It was her name. He seemed to strain to smile. The sight was too much for Ahsoka. She needed to leave, and quickly. The fact that she was leaving a helpless Anakin behind only occurred to her later. At least Rex stayed at his side. Ahsoka's legs gave in once she got outside and had to lean against the wall. She breathed, hard and fast, holding herself tightly. The shivers she felt had nothing to do with the room's temperature controls, but she did begin to feel better when Obi-Wan's warm hand held her shoulder. After a few more seconds of regaining her composure, Ahsoka demanded an immediate explanation. Obi-Wan told her about his perspective on everything that had happened since they last spoke over the hologram on Mandalore, Utapau, the Order, meeting up with Yoda and Senator Organa, learning the truth at the temple, and the confrontation on Mustafar. When Obi-Wan had finished, Ahsoka didn't want to believe his story. What she'd felt right before Rex attacked her wasn't Anakin's mutilation. It must have been Anakin's turn to the dark side, just as Maul had described. She felt stupid for not believing him now, and even more stupid for not telling Yoda Maul's warning when he had given her a second chance. If she had said something, she could have stopped all of this, couldn't she? She didn't want to think about that now. Obi-Wan's words about Mustafar didn't even register initially. It was all so out of character to her. How could Anakin have tried to kill his wife? Even that they were married was a shock to her, albeit a minor one. She knew about the relationship, but didn't realize how far they had gone. They hadn't just been married the whole time she knew them, but now they had children. And Obi-Wan, how could he have tried to kill his friend? his Padawan, his brother. But then, would she have done differently in his place? She didn't know. Ahsoka asked Obi-Wan if there was no other way, almost the same as Padme not too long ago. Obi-Wan said he didn't know anymore. Obi-Wan then explained why he brought her and Rex here. Anakin needed them. He needed Ahsoka. Anakin needed someone to be with him if he was ever to fully recover from all that had happened. Obi-Wan didn't think that it could be him after what he did to him on Mustafar. Ahsoka understood why Obi-Wan might feel that way, but was confused. What about Padme? Obi-Wan explained that she didn't trust Anakin after he nearly killed her, and all the other things 
he had done. Ahsoka shut her eyes and considered the mission she was being tasked with. Obi-Wan felt Anakin deserved better than him. But how was she any better? She failed to capture Maul. She failed to spread Maul's warning, even before. She had known Anakin was cherishing every extra second he was spending with her when she returned to ask for Republic support. It had killed her how much time she had to cut short, and she knew it was killing Anakin too. She had abandoned Anakin, and only now she realized she had taken him for granted. Ahsoka peered back through the window at Anakin. Maybe this was her chance to make up for her mistake. Before she went in to talk to Anakin, she asked Obi-Wan one more thing. Which was why had Anakin turned to the dark side? Obi-Wan said he couldn't be certain. He wasn't there after all. But he explained that before he had left, Anakin had been angry about not receiving the rank of master that Palpatine had recommended. He'd apologized to Obi-Wan, but Obi-Wan thought he might still have been angry. He might have turned if Sidious had promised him more power. Ahsoka flatly rejected this. She'd been wrong about Anakin not being capable of turning, but if he had, she was sure it would have been for a better reason. Obi-Wan said he would talk to Master Yoda about it, and left Ahsoka alone. Ahsoka went back into Anakin's room. Rex left Ahsoka and Anakin alone, having spent enough time with his former commanding officer. Ahsoka sat by his side, and searched for the right words. Eventually, she went with a simple expression of sympathy, that she was sorry for what happened to him. Anakin made a sort of smile with his lips pressed together, and Ahsoka could practically hear him joking, saying, Yeah, me too. That was enough to make her smile back. Her first smile since she left Mandalore. Ahsoka then began sharing her thoughts with Anakin, communicating telepathically with him, as her canon counterpart would do many years later with Grogu in The Mandalorian. She could feel his feelings, loneliness, remorse, powerlessness, but also gratitude for her presence. Anakin may have been scarred on the outside, but he was the same on the inside. She recognized him, and soon became confident Anakin could pull himself out of this rut and his life changed, but for the better and not the worse. Outside, Obi-Wan explained what had happened again to Rex. After learning this, Rex explained what happened on Mandalore, how Ahsoka had freed him from the mind control chip, and how Maul was set loose by Ahsoka. Rex decided not to tell Obi-Wan about Maul's prophecy of Anakin's turn. It was Ahsoka who chose to keep it a secret, and he wouldn't defy his commander. He knew she'd tell them when she was ready. Obi-Wan had told Rex about the Rebel Alliance that Padme had built, and suggested he attend their next meeting to shed light on the clone situation, and be a representative for any other clones like him. He told them this alliance to restore the Republic could use Rex and Ahsoka's help. Rex was eager to reclaim the Republic he had fought so long for, and was sure Ahsoka would feel the same. Ahsoka confirmed this moments later, when she finished sharing her thoughts with Anakin. She also said that she figured out a way to help Anakin best, which Obi-Wan was glad to hear. Some time later, the Jedi and Rebel leaders met again at Lake Verikano, away from prying Imperial eyes. Padme found lodging for Rex and the Jedi renegades in the underwater city of Utagunga, courtesy of Representative Binks. At the Rebel meeting, Rex told the Republic loyalists about Tup, Fives, his investigation into the inhibitor chips, his experience while under mind control, the way the clones can be deprogrammed, and the presence of clone deserters across the galaxy that would be eager to help. Obi-Wan then spoke before the Rebels, explaining his and Anakin's investigation into the disappearance of Jedi Master Sifo Dyas almost a year ago, how they uncovered the fact that Count Dooku played a key role in the creation of the clone army that would rise to oppose him. They admitted that this information had been wrongfully kept from the public to maintain their image. No, now we do. That guide the creation of the clones from the beginning. Dooku did. Hmm. Our enemy created an army for us. If this was known, public confidence in the war effort, the Jedi and the Republic would vanish. There would be mass chaos. Cover up this discovery. We must. Regardless of the Council's mistake, this suggested that at the very least, Palpatine withheld the true reason for the inhibitor chips from the Jedi, the Senate, and the public at large. At most, 
It suggested Palpatine and Dooku were working together from the very beginning, as Obi-Wan claimed they were part of a Sith conspiracy. The rebel leaders agreed that if evidence was to be found of a conspiracy by Palpatine to remove the Jedi NC's absolute power, it would be found on Kamino. Following the meeting, Ahsoka stayed to talk with Padme in private. Like the others, Padme was glad to see Anakin's old apprentice alive, especially since she hadn't seen her in so long. The last time she had spoken with Ahsoka was during her trial, which felt like a lifetime ago. Padme brought Ahsoka inside, where Luke and Leia were being babysat by one of her loyal handmaidens. She introduced Ahsoka to each of them. Despite the darkness surrounding their births, the young twins shined through the Force. Their presence filled Ahsoka with much happiness, and yet Padme was not so enthusiastic, only forcing a smile on their face when she saw Ahsoka tapping them on their noses. Ahsoka noticed the way Padme was acting, and Padme saw a look of inquisition growing on Ahsoka's face. She became embarrassed for a moment before saying, I... it's not that I don't love them. It's just... You see Anakin when you look at them. Yes. Or I'm reminded of him. She looked away from her children. Of what he did. Ahsoka looked at the twins. She didn't quite know what to say. She didn't know how to comfort her friend, or how she could help Padme and Anakin reconnect, if that was even possible. Eventually, she stood and turned to Padme. Why did Anakin turn? Padme looked up, surprised at the question. Obi-Wan said he was angry about not being granted the rank of Master. But that doesn't make sense. He wouldn't betray the Republic over something like that. There must have been something else. I don't want to talk about this right now, Ahsoka. Padme, I'm trying to help him. I want to, at least. But I can't do that if I don't know what happened. If you know what he did, then you'll understand why I can't talk about this right now. There are other things that need me more than him. He made his choice. Now he has to live with it. On Sabe's lap, Luke began to fuss. Padme picked him up and cradled him. Ahsoka watched as Padme comforted her son. She did understand, at least part of it. She didn't blame Padme for needing space from Anakin, or for prioritizing her children over him. She remembered the flood of emotions she'd felt in Anakin. He wants to make things right. I don't know if that can happen. I don't either. But he wants to make it happen. He wants to be with his children, to be there for them. If he's going to achieve that, I need to be there for him. I need to know why he turned. Padme, you knew him better than anyone. Why would he have done this? Padme sighed. She knew Ahsoka was right, but that didn't make any of it less painful. What do you know about Anakin's past? Obi-Wan told me he was a slave once. I... I didn't want to press the issue with him. Why is he so upset? Anakin has never talked about his past, has he? Only to tell me he won't talk about it. As a child, Anakin and his mother were sold into slavery by the Hutt clans. Oh. When Anakin joined the Jedi, he had to leave his mother behind, still enslaved. And right before the Clone War started, he began having nightmares about her suffering and dying. Obi-Wan and the other Jedi discouraged his attachment to her, and he wasn't allowed to do anything. By the time he was able to sneak behind the Council's back and find her, it was too late. A few nights before he turned, he said that he was having dreams again, but this time they were about me. That I would die in childbirth. Not long after, he said that he'd found a way to save me from his nightmares. I found a way to save you. The Chancellor must have promised him I would survive if he turned. Ahsoka remembered what she had sensed through the Force right before Rex attacked. I need him. That's what Anakin had said. That's why he'd betray the Jedi. That's why he'd helped Palpatine destroy the Republic. He was willing to sacrifice them even if it meant keeping Padme alive. Ahsoka realized how much that fact was weighing on Padme. Knowing how much had been destroyed, 
for her sake. I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of, and I'm doing it for you, to protect you. Do you understand now? Yes. Yes, I do. I'm sorry if I made things difficult for you. I'll be fine. Before, when I thought about raising them, well, back when I thought there was only going to be one, when I thought about it, I imagined him raising them with me. I don't know what to do now. I didn't prepare for this. Maybe one day he can still be a father to them. Perhaps. But he can't be my husband anymore. A short time later, Ahsoka descended to Utagunga to meet with Obi-Wan and Yoda to tell them what she'd learned. Although they hadn't considered it, neither were completely surprised. Yoda corroborated what Padme had said about Anakin's false premonitions. Anakin had spoken with Yoda about distressing premonitions of suffering and death the morning after having them. Obi-Wan also recalled how Anakin had been put on edge three years before when he saw his mother dying in his dreams. They wondered why Anakin's premonitions had not come true. Yoda explained that the future was always in motion, and premonitions could only paint a fraction of the picture. Still, if Anakin had been so adamant that Padme had died in his vision, that he would stop at nothing to prevent that, they suspected that the visions were induced by Darth Sidious as part of his manipulation. The three of them mulled over these revelations after their meeting. A few months later, the requisite parts had been found so that the droids at the Polis Massa Medical Facility could build a comfortable suit for Anakin to breathe, walk, and talk in for the foreseeable future. Ahsoka waited impatiently outside Anakin's operating room for the medical droids to be finished. Ahsoka wondered what the modifications might look like. The others had declined to come. Yoda, Obi-Wan, and Padme had their reasons, and Rex was away searching for rogue clones. Just as Ahsoka began to be irritated by the wait, the doors of the brightly lit operating room opened, and a white mist spilled out onto the floor. Ahsoka stood at attention. She heard the rhythmic sound of Anakin's respirator, and watched as a shadow in the mist became more clear, and then stepped out. Anakin, now with four robotic limbs and a chest plate with a high collar covering his throat. He had a hospital robe tied around his waist, but was otherwise unclothed. He closed his eyes, smiled, and felt the warm air finally return to his skin. The nerve damage mostly healed or repaired with an artificial skin graft. His skin was pale and some areas still pockmarked and wrinkled from the heat of the fires of Mustafar. It was terribly scarred, but it was his skin. With his eyes still closed, he was surprised by Ahsoka's warm embrace. When she relinquished, she asked Anakin how he was feeling. Not great. I had enough trouble getting used to one missing limb. The vocabulator trained its generated voice using samples of his voice from hollow recordings he'd given Ahsoka during her training. If you've done it once before, you can do it again. I believe in you. Thank you. I want to try running and jumping with these new legs. See how they feel. Good to hear you're taking initiative with this, but I want you to talk to Obi-Wan first. I assume you spoke to him? He doesn't want to see me, Ahsoka. No. He thinks you don't want to see him. I know that's not true. He just needs to know that too. Anakin was unsure for a moment. You're right. I do need to talk to him. I need to explain myself. It killed me that I couldn't before. Anakin and Ahsoka flew to Naboo to meet Obi-Wan at his Gungan hideout, just a day later. While on their way to Naboo, Anakin told Ahsoka how sorry he was for everything, and that he was grateful to have her by his side. She had her own thoughts on what he had done, but it wasn't the time or place for her to speak on it yet. When they arrived to Naboo hours later, Ahsoka had told Obi-Wan Anakin was there to talk with him before he came in. While Ahsoka had been happy to see Anakin walking on his own again, Obi-Wan was terrified. He could no longer avoid Anakin's judgment, whatever it was. They sat down opposite each other. Ahsoka stayed outside. Anakin spoke first. I'm sorry. 
I know you blame yourself for what happened to me. You think you failed me as a master and as a friend. I need you to know that my choice to join the Chancellor was not your fault. I need you to know that attacking Padme was not your fault. I make my own decisions, even bad ones. I feel terrible about what happened, about everything. But it wouldn't have happened without me. I'll learn to live with my mistakes. Obi-Wan was surprised, then considered more of what Anakin was saying. He looked emotional for a moment, and then became resolute. No, it wouldn't have happened without Palpatine. He manipulated both of us against each other. He was the architect of this whole situation. Now that he's gone, we have to fix it. Together. We'll fix it together, Master. And with that moment of understanding, the bond between them was reformed, but still imperfect and with many scars. The Empire's days were now numbered. Elsewhere, secluded in the crimson jungle of Dathomir, some of the most powerful drug lords and assassins met, having been called out of hiding by their master, Maul. He explained to them that while the threat of Palpatine was gone, his servant, a former Jedi named Anakin Skywalker, could still pose a threat to their future endeavors. The Syndicate leaders were skeptical, as neither Skywalker nor any other Jedi had appeared since the Purge. They also felt that even if he was out there, he was just one Jedi. Maul insisted that he posed a greater threat than they could imagine. Maul also told the Crime Lords it would be wise to lie low a little while longer, as soon Palpatine's empire would collapse without him as its puppet master. Maul had foreseen it. Shortly after the meeting ended, a substantial reward for a bounty was posted by an anonymous client. The reward was to be given at a precise location on the surface of Dathomir. Across the galaxy, the most skilled bounty hunters had a new target in their sights, Anakin Skywalker. And this concludes part two of this Elseworlds story.